I've uh, prepared a presentation with uh, a brief overview of the, the problem and then um, the approach that I've uh, developed to address it. So I'm just gonna start with a case presentation. This was my patient in 2006, and this is how I really um, became aware of the, the problem and, um, and in, involved in the, the search for uh, ho hopefully uh, a way to prevent it. Um, I, I was providing the intraoperative neuromonitoring for this case. Uh, it was a 52-year-old man, uh, metastatic cancer to the thoracic spine. So uh, a, a big, big case, anterior, posterior, eight hours long, large blood, blood loss. You know, we, we monitored the, the sensory and the motor evoked potentials and everything seemed fine. And sure enough, the, the guy, he woke up and he could wiggle his toes, but he was completely blind. And uh, the spine surgeon said to me that, that this has happened to him uh, every, every few years or so. And um, why aren't we uh, monitoring the vision? We're monitoring everything else. And uh, so th that's kind of how I, I started down this path. Uh, so the, the, the incidence of blindness following spine surgery, it's approximately one in a, a few thousand. Uh, I heard that you had three cases in 25 years. So maybe that roughly uh, would, would coincide um, depending on how many cases you've done. Uh, we, we, we know um, there, there's some risk factors that uh, increase the likelihood of this complication happening prolonged procedures, substantial blood loss, prone position, uh, male, obese, vascular disease. Uh, but the, um, really the, the problem with looking at the, the incidence and these risk factors is it, if it happens to your patient or you or someone you know, it, it, it happened and it's uh, one of the worst possible complications of of surgery, arguably uh, other than death, the worst thing. And uh, another another problem with this is most of the, the patients with the risk factors do fine, but but some patients without the risk factors is still go blind. And we know that for whatever reason, spine surgery in particular, even when it's not in the in the prone position, it's still uh, relatively high risk compared to other non-ocular surgical procedures. And the, the mechanism, why, why does this happen? Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is the most common uh, culprit associated with spine surgery. Although these, these other causes can happen as well. Uh, so what to do to prevent it? Well, this is the practice advisory that's been uh, published by the anesthesiologist. It was uh, originally published uh, more than 10 years ago, and uh, this was the most recent update. It was just this year. So recommendations are monitor the hematocrit and the blood pressure. But uh, th there's no real specific guidance in any individual patient where to keep the hematocrit, where to keep the the blood pressure, uh, vasopressors, same thing. Uh, avoid pressure on the eyes is always a good idea. Um, so head level or higher than the heart, neutral forward position, and then stage the procedure for high risk cases, um, which um, uh, have you ever staged a, a case ahead of time because you thought the patient might go blind? Uh, very, <clears throat> this is Jens, uh, very much so. I mean, staging is something we do quite commonly and we assure patients it's not due to laziness, but uh, at UW we had this kind of a two to three liter soft kind of a transition stop where if we'd hit that area, the incidence of a runaway coagulopathy would become very significant and then pressure problems and uh, uh, running behind on resuscitation would become a reality. So. Uh, that's a really big deal. So staging is part of our conversation with all major cases now. Great point. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, uh, 
thank you. I, I, I can uh, imagine, though, uh, it, it's probably a hard, hard decision because it, it carries its own, own risks and, um, and inconveniences. Um, so this is a, a, a little review of the anatomy involved. So on the, the right side is the, the visual system. So the, the light comes in through the eyes, uh, goes to the retina where there's a nerve signal generated, travels down the optic nerves. Uh, they cross at the chiasm where the, the fibers from each eye become mixed, uh, back through the optic tracts to the thalamus and then to the visual cortex. And on the, the left side is kind of a, a close-up of the optic nerve as it's exiting the eye, which um, highlights the, the vasculature and um, uh, probably with uh, the posterior optic nerve ischemia, it's uh, related to uh, uh, venous congestion and, um, and uh, basically relatively the, the perfusion pressure from the arterial side combined with uh, possible uh, relative anemia during surgery uh, it can't, can't overcome this, uh, this venous pressure to provide adequate oxygenation to the optic nerve. Uh, there's been studies done in primate models of optic nerve ischemia, and from those uh, models, we, we know that it, it takes over 100 minutes for this uh, ischemic nerve damage to the optic nerve to become irreversible. So theoretically, there's a, there's a window there where if the optic nerve ischemia could be uh, detected, uh, there, there could potentially be an intervention to prevent the blindness. And uh, that, that's kind of where um, monitoring the visual system through neurophysiology comes in. And there's a electroretinogram, which uh, can be recorded from electrodes placed on the skin near the eye. And this is directly recording the signal from the, the, the retina, which uh, uh, also would be sensitive to central retinal artery occlusion. And then the visually evoked response, which is recorded from the, the scalp at the back of the head over the visual cortex, uh, but it actually primarily reflects the, the function of the optic nerve anterior to the optic chiasm and the, the reason for that is because each eye is stimulated independently, so the, the light is flashed at, at one eye at a time. And uh, uh, visually evoked potentials are, in general, highly sensitive to any kind of uh, optic nerve dysfunction, uh, including ischemia. Uh, so uh, it... If uh, interoperative VAPs are em employed, uh, this kind of cartoon drawing sort of shows the, the schematic. It's uh, very similar to the other neuromonitoring that, that's done. There's a setup with uh, a, a computer and the uh, electrodes placed near the eye for the electroretinogram on, and on the back of the, the scalp. And then there's some sort of a stimulator placed over the eyes that can flash the uh, the light at the eyes, and so the, the lights flash at the eyes, and then the, these signals are are recorded. There's a output of uh, uh, basically just a, a squiggly line, and that's in, interpreted similar to uh, the other kinds of evoke potentials. Uh, so I, I'm certainly not the the first person to think about doing this. Uh, since the the 1970s, there's been visual stimulators on the on the market that are designed to uh, monitor visual evoke potentials interoperatively and they, they they really haven't haven't changed since the 1970s they're just off the shelf uh, swimming goggles or tanning goggles uh, this is an, an example one some of them I've seen even uh, still have uh, the speedo emblem on them and they've uh, uh, glued some LEDs into them and uh, th these have a, a number of uh, shortcomings which uh, prevent them from working, and it's why they're very rarely employed. They have uh, straps or, or, or bands that, that get in the, the way of things. Uh, they're designed to be reused uh, 
not not hygienic. Uh, they're they're unreliable. The uh, the type of LEDs that are, are used and the way that it sits on the face and the way it can move, and actually they they pose a physical uh, threat to the eye, particularly with prone uh, cases because they have a hard hard plastic that um, could could press on the eye. So it it could actually cause the complication that you're trying to prevent. Uh, so that uh, led me to uh, developing the uh, original Sight Saver, which is the, the larger device here. And there, there's no straps, there, there's no, no bands. They're just a peel away adhesive. It sticks onto the, the person's face. And it, in addition to monitoring the visual system, it, it actually uh, physically uh, protects the eyes. There's, uh, there's LEDs in there that have been um, especially selected and, and configured to provide an optimal stimulus. And then the uh, other, other smaller product there is a, a miniature version, which is designed more for intracranial procedures. It, it could be used during spine surgery if um, the, the person was not, not prone or the, the head was in pins or something like that, but um, it, it doesn't provide the, the physical protection to the eye and uh, obviously you wouldn't want anything pushing on those. It's the same same problem as the goggles. Uh, so this is a, a, a safe safe product. It's hygienic and um, it, it, it turns out it, it does effectively elicit the response. There's been uh, uh, two uh, studies published by independent groups during spine surgery with with the sight saver uh, successfully eliciting intraoperative visual evoke potentials uh, reliably. Uh, so uh, the, the, the idea of monitoring the neurophysiology during surgery, it, it really only makes sense if there's some kind of intervention that, that can be done. Um, I wasn't really interested in predicting who would who would go blind, but preventing people from going blind. Uh, so we, we know from these primate models of optic nerve ischemia that there there is a, a time window that we could intervene in. It's not likely that the the blindness is instantaneous, and so the the kind of things that could be done um, are uh, uh, sort of the things that uh, the anesthesiologists have come up with. So the, the blood pressure can be increased, the head could be elevated, uh, you, you could uh, transfuse, expedite the case, or, uh, or stage the, the procedure at that point. Uh, so uh, some of the, the practical uh, things about it, implementing a, a new product in the OR, uh, there, there are mechanisms for uh, recovering the, the cost of the device and uh, even uh, beyond the, the cost of it. Uh, so first there's the, the time-based uh, billing for the any kind of intraoperative monitoring, which if the case is already being monitored with other modalities, that's already being billed. Uh, but in addition, there's uh, add-on codes for the visual evoke potential and for the electroretinogram. And then the disposable device it, itself, um, for example, if the hospital purchases it, they they can um, they can recover the the cost of that device, or maybe even more than the the cost of it. And um, it, th there's different uh, mechanisms for doing this. It, it depends on the the type of insurance the the patient has and the particular way that things are set up at the hospital. And the uh, of course the um, there's the overall reimbursement for the, the spine surgery, which um, is, is, is fixed and the, the hospital doesn't want to add on any costs, but um, the, the cost of the device is really uh, negligible compared to the overall reimbursement. And uh, the, the cost of uh, uh, possible litigation, very often uh, when this happens, it, it goes, there, there's a lawsuit involved in uh, the research I've done is a three to $22 million settlements, uh, plus in some cases, uh, very bad press for the institution. 
so, um, you know, sh should a sight saver be used for uh, monitoring to prevent perioperative visual loss during spine surgery? Uh, the, the device can successfully monitor vision function in the operative environment, specifically during spine surgery. This may lead to preventing the vision loss. It's a very low risk device. Uh, the, it doesn't uh, provide, uh, cause much interruption to the workflow of the OR environment, particularly if you're already doing neurophysiology monitoring. This plugs right into the system that's already there. It's, uh, uh, the software is already on those computers. The neuromonitoring team has to uh, just kind of add the, the work set on, which is um, relatively easy. Uh, change to the program just has to be done one time. And there, there is a, a mechanism to recover the, the cost of the device and uh, maybe then some on top of it. Uh, so, so that's it. I, I know we don't have a lot of time. I wanted to leave time for any kind of questions or discussion. Great talk. Thank you, David. Um, uh, you'll, we'll give you a round of applause right now. I don't know whether you can hear it through the microphone, but we're applauding. Thank you. I certainly appreciate the effort. We have one of our leading neurophysiologists right here in the room. Can you go back? Uh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, so I don't know whether you heard the introduction I gave, but I had one of the three cases where our very good neurophysiologists at UW uh, did actually do um, a uh, intraoperative uh, visual evoke potential system. It did look like the Speedo glasses uh, that you showed before, the Speedo goggles. Um, and we actually were worried that they may have caused something in this patient because the patient woke up with significant raccoon eyes. So this was later than particularly shocking because we actually redid the test with a patient. Uh, uh, she was willing to undergo another general anesthetic. We gave her um, a then version of uh, Tiva and we could still get visual evoke potentials on the patient. So how sure are you that this is uh, uh, not, uh, or that this is immune to false negatives? Have you uh, yeah. So fall, false negative, so that the um, you're, you're saying that the visually evoked potential would would be maintained during the case, and the patient wakes up blind. That is correct. Have you ever heard of a case like that? Uh, no, no. Um, I mean, everything has some uh, some incidents of false negative, false positive, but um, what we we do know is visually evoked potentials are. Highly sensitive to uh, even uh, minor disruptions in the the function of the optic nerve. So, at at, at what point exactly that signal changes? Uh, how much that that you should intervene? Uh, ver it, I, I would say that that's not known. Um, and in this way, it's. Um, uh, somewhat analogous to the way uh, we were for motor evoke potentials for for many years, and even still to uh, some extent, it, it's controversial how to uh, interpret motor evoke potentials. Sort of complete loss of the signal, which uh, many neurophysiologists still uh, view the all or none approach in motor evoke potentials, sure. uh, which, which could be done with the visual evoke potentials, and it, it, to some extent, it's. It's a problem with many of the modalities in, in intraoperative monitoring. If you're kind of in this uh, gray zone, what, what, what I really think needs to be done is to look at the, the, the whole, whole picture. So if you um, uh, had, had, a, had a case that you're um, uh, six hours into a, a prone, prone procedure and uh, the, the face is all swollen, and you're starting to, to see some some changes. You know your, your actions might be different than um, if you were uh, just just starting a uh, ACDF and you were you were monitoring this and uh, and the case is going to be done in in less than an hour. So um, I, I think certainly that there there's unknowns 
with this and uh, what the incidence of false negatives is, is unknown. Great. No, thank you. And I like the design of your large goggles much more than what we had. I want to introduce you virtually to Dr. Sepp Kudi. He's one of you know one another, so uh, uh, Yehuda is going to ask you some really mean questions. <laughs> I'm sure. How are you, David? So the question is, the, the reason it didn't really catch in the intraoperative monitoring, didn't catch in terms of doing that more routinely, because the technology of the pattern shift is, is existent there for a long time, but the, the main uh, limiting factor was the fact that there's the pathway to the uh, uh, to the optic system is very multi interneuronal so the main factor limiting was anesthesia so that it was never really uh, sure that you're going to get it uh, because of anesthesia the work that was done in new washington which i'm aware of there was also one of our technologists that worked there mark balvin was involved in that uh, is that uh, they did it obviously as part of research, but I don't know how many times they didn't get it at all. Now, your device is great, your talk is great, the, the device is sensitive. The question is, are we promised to get a response every time? We don't have problems with motors, with sensories, with all of the others. The main question is, how likely are we to get the response with the visual evoked potentials? Right. So, um so this is a very important in question. And so the, the first question is about false negatives. Essentially, this is about false positives, which was my uh, uh, n number one uh, concern with the device. And um, in a real world experience, it, it turns out that it, it does um, reliably elicit the uh, response. And uh, I think there's a, a few reasons for that. So uh, one... One problem with the uh, older kind of goggles is the, the LEDs themselves. If you look at them, they're usually these red LEDs that are relatively low, low intensity. And in anesthetized patients, in many cases, they fail to saturate the response. So by analogy, imagine if you had a SCP stimulator, but that SCP stimulator had a, a, a maximum uh, output of um, uh, 35 milliamps or 30 milliamps. So um, uh, for, for some, some cases, uh, you, could, uh, you, you could get a response, but in uh, anesthetized patients, you're typically not going to saturate the SCP response. You, you know, in, in many cases, especially for lower SCPs, you need to go 40, 50, 60, or, or even higher to maintain that response. So it's the same thing with the, the VEPs. The, the LEDs that I, I selected, they're um, m much higher intensity and they're a full spectrum light. So if you look at it, it looks, it looks white. And besides that, the, the angle that the light leaves the LED is, is different. So one, one problem with those goggles is if you're monitoring a case, and you uh, have a response that if that goggle shifts just a little bit, the the light's not aimed at the eye the, the same way, and you uh, can lose the response. And and this this happened to me when I use those goggles. And when when it happens during uh, especially if it's during a, a prone surgical case, so you don't know what happened. You don't know if there was a a, a real. Um, surgery related problem, or if that goggle just moved a little bit and now you're not eliciting the response as well, or if that goggle moved and it's actually now pushing on the, the, the patient's eye and could be causing the, the patient to go blind. So it, everybody gets upset in that situation. The anesthesiologist rips the goggles off and that's the end of the, the, the monitoring. So be, because some of the placement of multiple LEDs in the sight saver and also the angle of departure of the light, these uh, six LEDs that are there for each eye, that there's a lot of overlap. So the, the sight saver is very stable once it's glued on the face, but it, if it moves a centimeter here or there, it's still providing the identical stimulus to the eye. So it, what we, we found is that with anesthetic regimens, similar to those used for MEPs, essentially, uh, 
Tiva or um, Modest Dose uh, Gas. They they went up to uh, half MAC, you know, in those studies that were published. The response is reliable, so um, th there have not not been excessive false positives. The, you answered the question very well, so I understand the advantage. So, so, so I, I'm more than happy to start using that technology if gents uh, want it. That uh, shouldn't be a problem. How many do you have uh, um, reliably? Do you get reliably responses? I'm not talking about false positive or false negative. I'm talking, do you get always responses? Uh, well, if the patient has normal preoperative vision, you, you you should you should get a response. I mean, but if you, you have an 85 year old person with diabetes and cataracts, you, you're not going to have a reliable response probably in that in that person uh, awake in your your clinic. So you're not going to get it in the OR. So as long as it's someone with a decent vision beforehand, you'll you'll get a response in the OR. Great. And then the last question is, how many cases, do you, do you count the cases that you did with your specific device? And do you keep track of success, no success in terms of getting the responses and all that? Um, well, the, the device is out there. It's FDA approved. It's on the, the, the market. Uh, I, I estimate it's been used in a, a few hundred patients. And I don't have any mechanism of of obtaining all that data. The there were the, the two studies that that were published. I think they each had had twenty subjects, so that's uh, uh, around 40, 40 patients. Forty out of forty, it was reliable. Uh, but beyond that, I, I really only know from the the, the feedback that I get get from people and the, the screenshots that have people have shared with me and and things like that. So um, I, I would like to have uh, th thousands of, of patients and have a good answer to your question, but sure. I don't have it. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And if someone else wants to ask questions. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, I thank you. I'd certainly be interested in using that for six hour or longer prone position uh, cases uh, with estimated blood loss in the two liter range. Uh, I'd, I'd be very curious to see and obviously publish uh, statistics, but it would probably take several years to accumulate the numbers uh, so that all the various fears get allayed. But I, as I said, I, I really like your vision or the goggle design far more. From a general physiologic standpoint, what we've uh, found is that, uh, and this is a painful lesson from the Iraq wars, um, the large administration of IV fluids is a bad idea in uh, bigger open prone cases because um, it leads to this kind of a edema in the optic nerve and creates a malperfusion setup, especially with patients who have a membrane swelling or instability tendency. Uh, so doing a more one-to-one -one or one-to-two uh, 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 proactive resuscitation with blood products seems to be vastly better. Jeff, any thoughts? Would you use this in a prone larger scoliosis of yours? I think it has a lot of potential. I, I would just like to know exactly what the cost is of this of this device. The, uh, the retail price is $745. That's for the uh, disposable stimulator. There's also a reusable cable that uh, interfaces with the neuromonitoring computer and the, the, the price for that, retail price for that cable is about $300. I'm happy to... yeah. Yehuda says he'll pay for it with his uh, platinum card, so <laughs> it's a done deal. Thank you, Dr. Angel. Thank you very much. Great topic. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate uh, the chance.